and welcome to my session and to my home recording studio in Aske, Norway. Calling it a recording studio would be a bit of an overstatement because uh, I had to borrow some equipment and uh, use some duct tape to put it all together, but I hope that um, it will all work just fine. This session is based on several engagements um, with my customers uh, I had over time in various stages of their Azure adoption who needed to answer a relatively simple question. Are we ready to go live with uh, product A or service B on Azure? And if not, what are we missing and how can we fix it? Each customer case was uh, very different in terms of uh, what they were building, what architecture they chose, what solution building bots they were using, IaaS versus PaaS, their maturity, the processes and tooling they, they use. Um, so I picked some important lessons, learns and tips uh, and put it together into this talk. So I would never claim this is a, this is a recipe or a cookbook on how to uh, enable production readiness uh, for you in Azure. But I do hope that uh, some of these uh, lessons uh, coming from practical uh, customer engagements can inspire you and help you in your quest for Azure production readiness. And whenever someone says uh, go live or production launch, I imagine this picture. It's a Apollo mission flight control. Where teams are gathered together and they call out the different parts of the systems uh, stating their go or no go uh, status. And of course, in the world of continuous delivery, we apparently all live in and we all are doing it this way. There is seems to be no place for a traditional mission control room like we used to have in the good old days where there were many engineers gathered together, maybe uh, doing some all night uh, or all weekend release. Um, but as an analogy, it still could serve the purpose simply because it all begins with what, what defines your production readiness. I believe that most of engineers uh, like to uh, have a very measurable KPIs or characteristics that they can take and apply it to the environment and see if there is any gaps or delta and try to fix it. So with our customers, we started uh, our journey for and try to find some kind of a checklist. Uh, and the obvious place where we started was the Azure documentation or Azure Architecture Center to be more specific. And we're primarily interested in two frameworks that are included in this big uh, documentation site. One is uh, Azure Well Architected Framework, which is a rebranded Azure Architecture Framework, and then it was um, Cloud Adoption Framework, which is which is fairly new. And surprisingly or not, uh, you won't find anything called Production Readiness Checklist uh, in in those sites. Uh, and if you try to Google it, you won't get uh, many useful hints either, uh, with one exception. So we uh, came across a very interesting uh, open source project available on, on GitHub, but also as a, as a website called the Azure uh, Readiness Checklist, which, uh, or Azure, yeah, the Azure Readiness Checklist, which uh, on its own is, uh, is a very compelling and, uh, and promising. So we, we tested it out uh, and it's based on a number of key areas, uh, like you, you can see on the, on the screenshot uh, around networking, service site, monitoring, continuous integration, and even costs. And you can, uh, you can go visit the website, uh, you can uh, start looking into those areas, and each area has a specific set of, let's say, recommendations or practices. You can read up uh, more details about it, and if you feel that you, you're good to go, you can just cross it. You can export this report as a JSON file or uh, even as a fancy PDF uh, and show it to your management. So that was um, that was working pretty well. We eventually also found something on the on the Microsoft website in the cloud adoption framework, which is called well architected review. And it's based on a very similar concept. You have some big, big areas, pillars or areas of interest, which you check if you want to uh, look into those or not. And then based on the, the answers you provide, you know, how you do stuff or if you do it at all. Uh, and it can be if anything from five to, I believe, 33 questions in the end. It will generate uh, a report that will 
guide you where is your gap and how could you fix it. So it's it's quite actionable. But it's these are all quite static lists. Uh, obviously, there can be some changes done in the background, and you are free to participate in that open source project and contribute with uh, some ideas. Uh, I guess they. Um, that uh, project uh, team would uh, really welcome it, but it it wasn't really something what we uh, what we were looking for. So both those checklists uh, can be used as a very solid baseline, but we soon realized uh, it wasn't complete. So the first important lessons that we learned is that the definition of production readiness is actually very unique to every organization or even team within that organization. We also learned that the hardest part. Uh, was uh, regulatory compliance with some strict regulations like SOX or PCI DSS if uh, the team was building a solution that has to comply with such requirement. It might sound like this is uh, mostly about operations, so it's not that interesting to developers. But there are some topics that uh, you need to tackle early on in the, in the design phase. So it's important to uh, to uh, bring those requirements early on because no one likes uh, to go back to the drawing board later in the game, right? On top of that, large enterprises, if you happen to work uh, for one, you, you know that, have their own policies and standards that they've built over time. They have ITIL and, and, and whatnot. And uh, if you build anything, you need to make sure that all your work is aligned with the different stakeholders and the requirements owners. So everything takes a lot of time. And lastly, even if you have some compliance teams with uh, SMEs that actually understand that regulation and can help you to make sure that your solution is compliant, it's not very straightforward to map those requirements to cloud controls and configuration. But don't worry, I know that uh, compliance is, uh, is not a very attractive topic, so I, I won't spend uh, any more time with it uh, in this presentation. So a good visibility of what's happening in your environment after you deploy uh, your solution is, is a key. So the first area we focused on in, in those engagements was uh, monitoring. and. Uh, it all begins with defining your monitoring strategy and uh, eventually a monitoring architecture. So there were some key questions we had to ask, specifically what should be monitored and how, and who needs, to, who needs this telemetry, and who should be notified if something happens, and who would define this what something happens. Um, there is also some consideration regarding retention of that data. You don't need to probably store uh, some metrics uh, for one or two years, but you might be required to store some uh, audit trails or some additional specific logs for several years, even in a specialized storage uh, to that is uh, called WARM, write once, read many. So again, compliance. <laughs> uh, but. Um, once you actually have this definition in place of, of that monitoring strategy, then you can start designing your monitoring architecture. And you have several options. Those of you who are, have been working in Azure know that uh, the Azure Monitor is a, is a holistic uh, product uh, that includes many features and can cover the entire stack. But maybe that's not what you, what you need. We have customers who like to bring their existing monitoring solutions from the on-premises environment and apply it on the machines uh, in, in the cloud. We also have seen uh, many customers using uh, third-party uh, products for specific functions like application performance monitoring, CM for security, and ITSM for service management. So it's important to know that even though Azure Monitor is very emphasized uh, solution as a Azure native one. It is also an open ecosystem and you can bring any tool that you, you like, you don't need to change. And uh, that's, uh, that's what the last bullet is about, bring your own tool. So instead of uh, collecting telemetry in Azure, you just want to make sure that you get it somewhere else where you want to analyze and visualize and maybe take some actions. But the uh, majority of my customers actually did embrace uh, Azure Monitor and, and started looking into how can we, how can we build this uh, monitoring architecture. So 
there are a couple of uh, considerations that we that we have to have to make. Uh, in Azure Monitor, everything that is uh, that you collect, and it could be either metrics or logs, is stored in uh, Azure Monitor workspace. And you can have several workspaces uh, scattered across your subscriptions. And if you have uh, an environment with uh, with dozens of subscriptions, then you start wondering what's the best model. Should I have one central workspace, or should I have one per subscription, or one per application? And for a long time, uh, there wasn't really a good way how you can centralize and consolidate. So there were three possible uh, design patterns, either a centralized uh, with one or the fewer uh, workspaces as possible. Then there were decentralized or distributed, and then something like hybrid, where people were actually collecting uh, logs several times, which is not very good from the cost perspective, but uh, that's what they, what they needed. But uh, Microsoft definitely recommends these days to uh, use centralized deployment model if possible. Uh, and there are several uh, reasons for that. Uh, one is that um, you should avoid uh, so-called multi-homing uh, setup for Azure VMs. First of all, uh, and what, what does it mean? It means that you can send telemetry to multiple workspaces from, uh, from your Azure virtual machine. Uh, first of all, it's uh, supported only on Windows VMs or on Linux VMs. Uh, you can only send uh, to one workspace. Um, and uh, the recent changes in, um, in the application insights for those of you who like to use uh, that product for application level monitoring uh, also allow you to now to consolidate both application and infrastructure or platform telemetry into one single workspace, which wasn't possible before. Every time you spin up uh, an app insights, it created its own workspace. Uh, so now you can actually have that in, in one single repository. And the second fact that allows uh, my customers to start with consolidation was that um, um, Azure Monitor introduced resource level permissions, um, which is the, the new access control mode. What it allows you uh, is that you can actually really consolidate the logs in one place, but um, your visibility to, uh, to that repository will be based on what permissions you had in those original resources that uh, are sending that telemetry to the workspace. It means that you can apply granular RBAC without compromising, um, compromising security. And of course, uh, if you have uh, one or just a few workspaces, it simplifies uh, cross-resource queries if you want to build uh, uh, complex queries uh, using KQL or Kusto query language. So that was the first uh, design uh, that we that we applied in, in, in that customer engagement. And if you try to look at the, uh, the data collection, uh, how it works in Azure, uh, and we are mostly interested in uh, on the left side in those great uh, gray boxes, not the custom sources that you, of course, can bring if you really want. But um, on the platform level, meaning of a Azure tenant, Azure subscription, and Azure resources, you have basically zero instrumentation. You, need, you don't need to put any, any sort of custom code. All you need to do is uh, use something called diagnostic settings and apply it to those uh, elements. And you can choose whether you, uh, you basically have two sets of choices. One is where this telemetry will go. And uh, Azure Monitor Workspace is only one possible destination. You can either choose that or you can send the data to your uh, Azure Blob Storage, uh, which is typically good for archiving, but uh, you don't really want to query that raw data uh, yourself. That's why Azure um, Monitor uh, workspace is, is much better for, for the analytics part. Uh, the third option is um, stream it to Event Hub, which helps you to actually really bring that uh, third party tool that you, you love and, uh, and want to continue using. So you, you don't have to choose uh, Azure Monitor, but in some way you will actually just enable um, diagnostic settings on those resources and make, make sure that the telemetry goes out from your environment to that third party system. 
On the infrastructure level, if you use um, Azure VMs and VM scale sets, it's, it's a bit different because uh, now here we talk about uh, deploying agents that can report uh, data from the OS level and above. You can bring even some custom logs as well. Uh, and you can, you can send that data to that, uh, to that workspace. Obviously, if you choose to use a third party product, uh, you will typically install their agent on, on that machine and not uh, Microsoft Monitor agent. And on the app level, like we said, if you choose to use application insights, you can either deploy an agent or use uh, an SDK, depending on um, what's, uh, what, what you are building. So now when we understand where the data is collected, uh, we had to figure out how to onboard all those resources uh, because we were always using a combination of uh, VMs and some managed services meaning paths like Azure SQL DB and service bus and event hubs, um, how to actually onboard those resources to your um, Azure Monitor workspace at scale, meaning I don't really need to think about it. Because obviously this configuration can be part of your ARM template. Yeah, you can use PowerShell CLI to, to enable it. Uh, and I believe that you will, you will find the support in Terraform and, and other uh, infrastructure as code uh, tools uh, for doing that. But what we experimented with and found as, um, as the most useful thing that uh, it's more like fire and forget, uh, you don't need to think about it anymore, is a, is a policy-driven approach. Azure Policy is typically um, a tool that is used by central cloud team or central governance team. So application developers and uh, DevOps teams, they, they don't really think about um, this tool as a uh, part of their toolbox. But um, in fact, if you have, as long as you have necessary permissions, you can use Azure policies even within your subscription that you are given to, uh, to play with or to actually do some serious work. So what you can do is, um, and those of you who don't know, there is something called policy definitions and policy sets. So policy definition is, uh, is strictly defining what conditions uh, you're, you're assessing and what should happen after the, the conditions are met, if, if the, if the uh, conditions are true. And policy sets is just a combination. It's combining individual policy definitions into one, uh, one bigger definition. So it's much easier to do uh, the second step, which is called policy assignment. And there is also uh, built-in policies that are provided by, by Azure, and you can always just enable them, or you can bring and build your own custom policies. So uh, when we were checking, you know, how can we uh, cater for all those different uh, Azure resources uh, and uh, enable automatically this um, diagnostic settings uh, on them without really thinking about it every time we deploy something, uh, we learned that uh, the, those built-in policies uh, were available only for like 10 uh, resource types or Azure services. But um, we also searched, and uh, here I would like to call out uh, a great work done by one of our MVPs, uh, Tao Yang, uh, and you can see the, the link to his blog post. He actually made a collection of, I believe it's close to 30 or 35, policy definitions for, for uh, all various um, resource types that support diagnostic settings. So you can easily import those definitions and you can, um, you can also apply them using the script uh, that he also wrote. So if you apply those policies on your subscription level, whenever you create, let's say a service bus, the policy will kick in after this deployment because uh, it's using something called deploy if not exist policy um, or it's policy mode. And it will ensure that uh, if that policy, if that resource didn't have this uh, diagnostic settings configured as part of the deployment, it will actually trigger a, a additional deployment and it will do it for you. And in that uh, policy assignment, you can define not only what metrics and logs you're interested in and you want to um, you want to work with. But you can also define into what workspace using workspace ID, uh, and now I mean uh, Azure Monitor workspace, where do you want to send that data to? 
So in this way, we managed to uh, just import those uh, policies and uh, do policy assignment. And now whenever there is someone in the team creating uh, a resource that is supported by this policy set, it will uh, enable the diagnostic settings and, and make sure that uh, you get the telemetry uh, sent to that workspace. And um, that was about resources, but we also said that for Azure infrastructure or virtual machines, it is rather different. So it's important to call out that uh, there are various agents that you can enable. And depending on, on whether it's a Windows or Linux uh, VM, whether it's, uh, it's Azure VM or uh, your on-premises or even third-party cloud, cloud machine, you can choose and, uh, and install that agent and they all can send telemetry uh, and those logs to the, to the workspace of your choice. So it's important to see uh, and distinguish uh, what each agent can do, uh, what machines it can target, uh, what data it can collect and, um, and where it can send the data to. So since we covered the, uh, the first topic of um, handling all the, all the resources other than VMs, now we had to find uh, a similar way how we can make sure that whenever we spin up a bunch of VMs for our solution where we will host the code, uh, where our application will run, uh, we want to make sure that it will also uh, provision that uh, log analytics agent. So we will be getting the telemetry from the VM uh, to the same workspace so we can query the data and work with it. And so luckily, uh, there is a built-in policy initiative for that. It's, um, you can see it on the, on the slide. It's called Enable Azure Monitor for VMs. And it's a collection of, uh, of uh, individual policies. And it will make sure that uh, uh, you will not only get this log analytics agent, but also dependency agent, which is uh, very nice. Uh, it's uh, used in um, log analytics in part called service map where you can actually plot a map of all those components and you can see how they are dependent on each other and how uh, your VMs are talking on different uh, TCP or UDP ports together. So it's, um, it's a very useful tool for doing migrations, uh, for instance, to the cloud, but it could also help you in, uh, in, your, uh, in your daily operations if your solution is based on, uh, on infrastructure as a service because not everybody is doing containers. So the, now we, we are collecting a lot of uh, useful metrics uh, and diagnostic logs. Uh, but the second most important uh, area in, uh, in production readiness is obviously security. And here it's uh, really about, I've seen many customers trying to avoid discussions about who actually, whose responsibility is that? So kind of uh, difficult, especially in large environments uh, where you have a traditionally some kind of SOC team, security operations center, um, to determine who should actually be responsible for collecting, analyzing, and reacting upon a security telemetry coming from Azure. And um, it's always a discussion whether this should be a centralized function or it, uh, or whether should it should be a responsibility of individual DevOps teams uh, that are uh, that are using uh, Azure services. And of course, there is no one good answer to that. Uh, it's it needs to be aligned with your cloud operating model. But once it is determined, uh, there are a few things that um, uh, you should try to operationalize. The first section is recommendations. And you should try to do regular review of those recommendations because they can, uh, they are, they represent potential vulnerabilities. Um, Azure will actually check uh, what you have in your subscriptions and how your resources are configured against its own sort of best practices security baseline, and it will it will show you the gap and it will recommend you something. Obviously, you're not obliged to follow those recommendations. But it's it's um, it's useful to at least look into that, and you can uh, if as long as you you get uh, many of those recommendations, it's sort of hard to prioritize what you should tackle first. That's why the um, uh, Azure Security Center uh, introduced uh, Secure Score, which is uh, a very 
uh, good high level uh, KPI that you can sort of drill into and see what are the most critical uh, areas uh, that require your attention from security standpoint. Uh, the second part is, of course, uh, what happens if you have incidents, security incidents management. And um, traditionally, there are very strong products uh, on the market, uh, uh, like, um, which now I forgot the name, uh, Splunk, of course. Uh, but Splunk is, uh, can also be used for infrastructure monitoring, uh, not just for security. So um, many customers uh, just want to make sure that uh, this, uh, those uh, security incidents and events are streamed to their uh, CM solution, uh, and they can, they can actually work with it uh, uh, on that side. Uh, Microsoft, um, not that recently, introduced uh, their own uh, CM product called Azure Sentinel. So if you choose to use this product uh, instead, there is an easy way how you can onboard uh, all your security center workspaces uh, into, into Sentinel and start working with that data. Um, there is also something called workflow automation, meaning that uh, if, you, if you just want to uh, be notified about recommendations or uh, threat alerts that are coming uh, to your uh, Azure Security Center, you just make sure that um, uh, the, you enable a certain workflow and you can send the data to various third-party products. Uh, anything from Slack to, to Teams, uh, you can create an issue on GitHub, um, you can create a new work item in, in DevOps sports. So it uh, depends on, uh, on uh, what you use and how your processes look like. But of course, uh, this Azure Security Center is not useful un un unless it has, uh, again, some uh, relevant data to work with. So um, you need to make sure that you, uh, you can enable uh, data collection for Azure Security Center. And there are additional things that you need to understand how to configure your uh, Security Center workspace. Um, not only that auto provisioning option, which you may not uh, want to choose, but uh, again, it's very useful because whenever there is a new resource uh, created in, uh, in the target subscription, it will be automatically onboarded to uh, the security center. But it, there are also things uh, regarding the pricing and um, setting up various security contacts for notifications. So it sounds a bit tedious, but uh, luckily everything, of course, can be done through code. So you can, um, can either just create an ARM template with all those uh, all those resources and configuration that you that you require, and enable various um, various uh, elements like in the recommendations uh, in the JSON file. You can see you can turn on different uh, different uh, uh, like SQL auditing or web application firewall. And uh, you can package it uh, also as a as a blueprint. Or you can again use uh, deploy if not exist policy we talked about when we were onboarding uh, diagnostic settings. So you can use any of these three delivery methods, but running a, running a script um, works fine too. Um, probably everybody knows that uh, moving to the cloud is a lot about shared responsibility model and how you're going to support it. So I mentioned the cloud operating model. I actually had a talk on at NDC Oslo last year about, about how to build your cloud operating model. And it hasn't changed. Uh, it is still a very important topic. And in some customer uh, scenarios, uh, this is uh, more or less a blocker for their cloud adoption, unless they figure it out and understand who's doing what, uh, they, they cannot move forward and really go to production. And you have various uh, models. Um, obviously, DevOps is uh, is quite familiar to people. Then uh, there are there is a model called AppOps, where you have an application team who only knows the application um, and what it's due from the business perspective and can do some technical configuration, but it, they don't want to handle the infrastructure operations. Uh, so that's uh, how maybe vendors or managed services partners come into play. 
and uh, especially in Norway, uh, we have we um, we have used uh, IT outsourcing quite heavily. So it's not uh, uncommon that uh, a lot of operations is outsourced to a third party. So if you're going to the cloud, you need to answer this question: What will be the role of my current managed service uh, provider or vendor in that new model? Or can I do everything myself? And if yes, will I use some uh, centralized or decentralized model? Will I provide some shared services that are common for everybody? Or will I uh, allow a full autonomy and uh, with that full responsibility? But um, either way, uh, there are parts of that delivery that it will always be done by your cloud provider, which is Microsoft. So uh, depending on what um, what sort of purchasing model you chose, either it's a CSP uh, or you are on enterprise agreement, you have a direct or even pay as you go, you can choose various Azure support plans. If you are on a CSP model, then your uh, CSP partner is the first line of support and you always talk to them whenever you have some issues and they use Microsoft uh, support as a second uh, second tier. So you have four models uh, for Azure support and uh, the first one basic is always included for all customers, but it doesn't have a lot of uh, extra extra benefits and uh, strict uh, uh, service level objectives uh, for response times, uh, depending on different criticality. Uh, so depending on how critical your application or service is, you should look into uh, standard or professional direct to ensure that you have the right support from Microsoft uh, when uh, something happens. And things do happen. So uh, the first thing that uh, we learned, and um, you probably recall uh, last week, there was some uh, global uh, outage or some problems with uh, Azure Resource Manager. You really want to know what's happening. And obviously you can watch uh, the Azure status page, but uh, that's very, very generic and it's like a global view. Uh, you can, you can of course filter different regions, but um, what is uh, uh, more recommended is to configure service health uh, and service health alerts. So this is a personalized view because uh, it's uh, only reflecting whether the service incident happening on the platform is impacting you and your subscriptions because it knows what resources you deployed and in what regions. So it won't give you those like false positive um, uh, alerts. Uh, and there are several categories of those events. Uh, service issues are the most common really when something happens. There is also plan maintenance which can help you to uh, proactively um, uh, do maintenance of your virtual machines uh, because the underlying uh, infrastructure needs to be uh, needs to be maintained uh, and typically patched. And there are other two. So again, you don't really want to spend time looking into this screen. So what you can do is you can configure health, health alerts. Uh, those alerts are written to the Azure Activity Log. So all you can do or what's the most straightforward way how to deal with it is to use action groups, which are part of Azure Monitor, and configure specific actions. What should happen when uh, such uh, health alert occurs? You can use simple emails. Uh, you can configure a notification to Azure App, which is a really nice uh, mobile app that I would recommend you to, uh, to install and, and use. Uh, but more importantly, it actually uh, allows you to trigger any third party uh, um, integration, like you have ServiceNow, PagerDuty, Ops Genie, uh, and, and many more. Anything that supports webhooks can actually be triggered and you can send that uh, alert as a payload. And creating those alerts obviously is also supporting using ARM templates, so you don't have to manually configure everything yourself. You can define both alerts and action groups in form of ARM templates and deploy them to your subscriptions uh, in, uh, in, in bulk. And then obviously you can have uh, dashboards where you can combine uh, different views uh, and different uh, metrics uh, and the, the mobile app that I mentioned previously. So thinking about how can you operationalize those alerts coming from Azure Monitor in form of notifications or even automated actions, then 
you start from the left with simple notifications, SMS, voice, email. That's very common. What is more interesting is uh, building workflows. And I will have later on an example of uh, using Slack uh, if you do chat ops. So how can you be notified about something happening on the platform using the platform that you're probably in at the moment in the NDC conference? Uh, you can also file bugs to Jira, to GitHub, to Azure boards using the same uh, infrastructure, the same mechanisms. And you can build custom uh, custom reports if you want to. For people who are uh, really into IT service management, then there are pre-baked connectors for most uh, commonly used ITSM uh, tools or platforms like ServiceNow. So it's, it, uh, you can easily integrate these two uh, platforms together and uh, check all those alerts in, in ServiceNow if that's uh, how you uh, do the operations. And as I mentioned, uh, anything that is not uh, pre-built, but uh, you can address with web uh, books, uh, you can use, uh, use that too. If you sort of invest even more and you can actually identify based on specific event, what could be the auto-remediation uh, action, you can use uh, either Azure Automation or now very popular uh, Azure Functions, which are also an event-driven automation uh, and serverless as well. And you can close that alert and close that loop by calling a specific uh, automation script that will remediate. So uh, depending on how much you want to invest into automation, you can basically use uh, use the entire scale here. So the uh, the example here I use with uh, with ChatOps. So uh, you can use Slack, uh, and again you have a few options how you can integrate uh, those third party tools. First, I would like to call out that there is a difference between uh, getting notifications from Azure versus Azure DevOps because both. Uh, both tools or platforms uh, can um, can be integrated with Slack. But uh, in Azure DevOps, uh, you're building a specific integration for maybe checking what's the build status or how your release go, or maybe if a release requires an approval because there is a decision gate. Whether uh, in Azure, it's really about any type of event, you can actually send uh, in form of a message to a Slack channel. And it's up to you. Uh, you can either use um, write everything yourself, uh, and typically you can, for instance, use functions uh, with Node or, or or .NET and build uh, your code yourself, or you can use uh, Logic Apps, which is a, a low code option where you can build a workflow, and you have over three hundred built in connectors, for instance, Slack. So you can easily uh, take a step by step approach and define what kind of data from that original event you want to send to that Slack channel. And you just uh, authenticate to, to your Slack um, account and, um, and then your, your work will start working. And just to, just to um, um, highlight a, a, a few options. So this was, uh, uh, the first one was uh, Logic Apps to Slack. Uh, where you are using uh, something uh, coming from uh, Azure Monitor. It's typically uh, some uh, uh, metrics. But you can also uh, use EventGrid, which is pops up uh, uh, notification service, and you can subscribe to specific events uh, using event subscription, and those you can send to, uh, to Logic Hub. So there are two patterns how you can build this integration. And this one is what I mentioned previously. And I believe that uh, I have two more slides which are not probably that relevant. Yeah, maybe the last one. So you might have heard about Azure Advisor and I, I would admit this is not a production critical uh, thing to operationalize this, but it will, it's, uh, it's again and um, recommendation engine that will look into your subscription, your resources, and it will assess those against some baseline uh, on several criteria or areas. Uh, it's cost, 
which is something that yourself, it's probably quite difficult to do a s assessment. It's security, but this is, m this is merely um, a mapping from uh, all those recommendations coming from the Azure Security Center. It's about high availability, so it will recognize whether your application um, maybe requires or might need some improvements in, um, in availability uh, design. So running something on a single VM is a good example. Operational excellence is, uh, is, is a recent addition where it can actually check how you're actually running those uh, resources in Azure and it can advise you on, on improving uh, the operational side. And the last is performance. So it can use certain benchmarks and it can recommend you uh, to boost your uh, performance by maybe tuning uh, what kind of SKUs you're using uh, or changing, uh, changing the, uh, uh, the configuration in, in other way. And Advisor, again, has its own uh, UI. Uh, it's part of the Azure platform, but uh, you don't have to use it. You can configure alerts. So whenever there is some recommendation, I just want to, I just want to send it out to uh, the tool I, I, I use. It could be, again, Slack teams. It could be, it could be some operational database. So um, you would use the same infrastructure using action groups um, and define some conditions so you can all get the data out and you don't have to use the Azure portal for that. So I would like to close this talk and leave some, uh, some um, few minutes for, for questions. These were all examples of what we did, what we tried and what we learned while working in those projects. And it would be really great to hear your experience and uh, what have I forget? And I, I do admit that it, it is not a it is not a complete list, obviously. And those uh, those checklists that I mentioned in the beginning, they they uh, give you m more and more points. But um, I do hope that um, you learn something new. Uh, how other companies are are maybe uh, preparing for production readiness using various tools available in Azure. And I would like to thank you like to thank you for your participation.